Okay, geht zu dir. Om. O Bhagavad Gita, by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters from within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us. O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows, The milker is the cowherd boy Krishna, Arjuna is the calf, and people of purified intellect are the drinkers. The milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled cross mountains. Okay, we're, um, we've just discussed intellect and will, um, which are really the two powers that, that are on loan to us as individual, mm. as Jiva, um, universal powers. And these are the, these are the movers. Um, with intellect, we, have, we are given the capacity to work out what needs to be worked out and everything along the way, um, conscious mind. And then with will, will is really the only power that the jiva has. The only, um, the only thing individual about us is the idea of individuality. And the, and the great power that we're given is the power to invoke mm-hmm. or to call forward. And that's the, that a little game that we've been playing that Hari got tired of a couple of days ago about lifting the hand and observing what's happening and all of this. So, so he chose with his willpower not to engage. <laughs> so, which is demonstration of beautiful demonstration of will, nonetheless, isn't it? So, instigator agency like that. Um, but but beyond agency. Um, Agency has to do with why we do, as it were, but, uh, but the will is the power to invoke or to call forward whatever action we, we choose, whether it, whether it um, happens or not is God's will. And anything happening here is God's will, is universal will as well. Oh. So from here we move to, um, to now continuing on, the, on exactly the same program that Lord Krishna has us, has us involved in, which is pleasure, um, discussion of pleasure, starting now. Um, and it starts here in Shloka 36. Yeah, let's do this one. And now hear from me, O Arjuna, of the threefold pleasure in which one rejoices by practice and surely comes to the end of pain. So this is also Raja Yoga teaching, and what's shared here is also very directly from Upanishad. It's um, Kata Upanishad. Um, But here, um, a a unique perspective of it. So now hear from me the threefold pleasure. So threefold still gunas, right? Mm. And pleasure, which, and everything, every action it seems that we take has something to do with happiness or or pleasure. Um, Even knowledge, even pursuit of knowledge, generally speaking, will be to know that which will bring happiness, that which with known will bring happiness. And so here Lord Krishna doesn't doesn't dispute that. Um, he says, then, since that's your highest pursuit, then hear from me about the three types of pleasure and, um, and 
which one then leads you towards the cessation of pain, which is what you want. You want the suffering to stop. So 37, that which is like poison at first, but in the end, like nectar, that happiness is declared to be sattvic, born of the purity of one's own mind due to self-realization. There's actually a lot going on with this one. So um, first is the, it, it's the Upanishadic teaching about the path of good versus the path of pleasure. Um, the Sanskrit word for pleasure is uh, sukham. We've heard the word. Uh, it's an interesting word because it's, again, one of those universal words. Uh, what does sukham mean? What does sukra mean? Sugar. Sugar. So talking about sweetness, but being translated as pleasure. Hmm. Um, there's another word which, which often gets translated as sweetness, and it has a different connotation. What's that word? We've discussed, so it's here somewhere. If you call it forward, you might find it. Prasadam. Prasadam. But that's the word prasadam is not talking about a human kind of pleasure experience or pleasure experience for the jiva. Prasadam is talking about an aspect or nature of the divine, nature of the absolute, which is sweet. Which is sweet. Mm. So here's sukham meaning um, pointing to pleasure. But it has to point to ultimate pleasure or some pleasure that's beyond pain because every other pleasure that we get involved in is pleasant only for a little bit and then painful. Huh? Whatever we, Swami Premananda used to say in discussions like this, he would say, everything we do, we actually do in order to stop doing it. Um, and if you look, you'll see anything that we do for pleasure, we reach a point where we where the pain is so intense, the cost of it is so intense that we have to stop it. Huh? The, the, and here the, the three are discussed, and we can continue in this. But first, that which is like poison at first, but in the end like nectar, that happiness is declared to be sattvic, born of the purity of one's own mind, due to self-realization. Um, Swami Chivananda has this commentary. He says, in the beginning, agre visham eva, he's translating, in the beginning, it's attended with much pain as one has to abandon the, the pursuits that we think will lead towards happiness, that we believe will lead towards happiness. Um, Now, Trash, we had, we had a conversation the other day, and there was some angst around it, too, which is completely understandable about, but I want to do what I want to do, and what's wrong with that? And actually, I could say from here, there's nothing wrong with it if you can figure out what you want to do. <laughs> In other words, what is the fruit supposed to be of what you want to do? Right? So if you can determine what you want to do, then do it. And actually in the, actually in the scriptures, we're advised to do what we want to do, but then a proviso that comes with it would be twofold. Meditate upon what it is, consider it, really consider it. Um, and then second is don't get distracted along the way. Because what we tend to have happen is that because of the legacy with the, with the idea that the sense objects are going to give happiness, and it's a legacy, it's a habitual groove within this mind, right? Because of that legacy, it, as we're going through life, whatever it is that we want to do, the tendency will be to get distracted along the way. And now we have something new we want to do or something better that we want to do. 
which means we don't actually have the opportunity to do what we wanted to do in the first place and learn what we were to learn from it. You were, you were talking about the pioneers who are your ancestors. And you know what came here after is, yeah, and why do we think that they're not self-controlled? Self-control is an inner state. It's not, what, not about what you do on the outside. So if they were fording rivers and all of this coming across the country, did they actually do it or they, did they have parties and do drugs along the way? <laughs> Why do we think that they weren't self-controlled because they were doing what they wanted to do? There's nothing wrong with doing what you want to do. Um, and Krishna's teaching here is do what you want to do and offer it. <laughs> offer the fruit from it. And that's dharma. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that. And that's not what the teaching is, is saying. It's really speaking to self-control. Where And self-control is difficult. It's hard. Um, and ego being told there's a need for control in order to be successful. Ego will rebel and say, but I want to do what I want to do. And then the next discussion is, okay, my dear, then what do you want to do? Let's do that. <laughs> and let's not get distracted along the way. Um, and if we were to do that, then that would take us back to the same self-control. We, we would have to control this relationship between I, the mind, the senses and the sense objects. Um, and that's also what's being discussed here. It's the same, it's really the same. Um, uh, and there's a learning that, that it's not what we want that provides pleasure, happiness, and in this case, the same word is used. Sukham is the same. It's used both for happiness and pleasure here in this translation. The same word is used. Um, so you could say, okay, fine, pleasure is happiness, but only the pleasure which actually eradicates pain, which means a pleasure that's eternal, that's never ending. Um, generally, we differentiate happiness. But, but in the divine estate is said to be that satisfaction which eradicates pain, which one would say, one who's there would say, it is absolutely not unpleasant. There is no seeking of pleasure within this space. Right? It, it, it's absent. It's done. So then it's fair to say highest pleasure. It's fair to say it, because what we've been looking for is the same. Uh, so it, it, it's fair to say it. Usually it doesn't get said, but here it's actually in these translations, and we look through all three of these, and it's being translated the same. So, um, so and here Lord Krishna is saying, let me teach you of the pleasure which is beyond pain. Hmm. And then sattvic is given. And what's being said is that, that that pleasure which results from the acceptance of pain in order to control oneself is sattvic. So that pleasure which is, which is like poison in the beginning, hmm, Tendency like anger, for example. You know that it's not beneficial, but you also know it's habitual. Right? And you get to see how it arises. And so you resolve, okay, I'm going to overcome it. Oh, God bless you. But it's not easy to overcome it. Right? It's hard. And so to do it, it's, it's an experience. It's like taking poison at the beginning. It's, oh, my God, I have to stop engaging in these trigger activities, right? And I have to, 
I have to really develop habits to see things in different ways, to see relationships in different ways, to see, to see what's highest knowledge in different ways, to see truth in different ways, right? Yes, and yes. that's so darn hard. Yeah. But facing the ugliness of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, facing the idea of ugliness, which is hard, <laughs> because we want to hold on to it as a defense mechanism. Right? So, so it's being said here that pleasure that results from taking it on and bringing this relationship into alignment, into a place where, where the light is in control of it, where we've actively given it over to the light and now it's in alignment. And whatever we want to do is our dharma, it's fine, it's perfect, go do it and offer the results, then that pleasure... The experience is sattvic pleasure. In other words, it doesn't go. The satisfaction doesn't go at that point. It doesn't, it's not something lost again. And, and pain, which would be bodily pain, isn't even disturbing anymore. Because one knows it comes, it goes. You know, when, I'm, when I'm here in alignment with this body, it comes, it goes. So fine. <laughs> so it doesn't disturb the, um, the satisfaction. The sukham at that point. So it's said to be sattvic. And then we can compare that with rajasic which, and tamasic, which we'll be very familiar with. <laughs> I practiced a lot of experimentation with these in this, in this part. <laughs> 38. That happiness or pleasure which arises from the contact of the sense organs with the objects, which is at first like nectar, and in the end like poison, that's declared to be rajasic. So that's all of our stuff where we get pleasantly distracted, and we're doing in order to be happy. And I, and there was a realization at some point, and, it, and it's the funniest thing, it's the craziest thing, because I was very much there. Um, which, thank God, led to this incredible suffering and depression and all of that. But, but it was as if in this inner world, it was, there was a formula that was being followed by this mind. And the formula was, create or craft a life which consists only of pleasurable experiences, which has no painful experiences. And there was a, there was a conviction in here that that would be nirvana. And so, and we look in our psyche and we're going to see something resembling. It's, it's a, when, when in the company of this notion of separation, there's a structure being built in the psyche about then how to find that happiness, which I can't live without. And for each of us, it will consist of this raga dvesha, which is um, what I like or what I love and what I don't like or what I want to avoid. And then all of the mechanisms that are that come around that, which have us um, pursuing what I like or love and trying to build a life without, but without the pain or the possibility of the things that would destroy the happiness. And so that's really the only way the mind can construct a way to happiness. Otherwise, the mind has to deconstruct and to deconstruct it needs a master. <laughs> but at some point we find, but my mind is my master. And that's the point where we say, ah. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> Something's not working right here. <laughs> ah. And that's the movement from Rajas to Sattva. That point is when, is when we start to ask these questions and start to, start to take resolves and such. I, um, but actually, we have to come to rajas first. And so tamasic pleasure. Um, and we have this beautiful example of, uh, of our dear Gopala, who's off driving a truck somewhere today, so, who knows a lot about this tamasic pleasure. And I have a lot of experience with it, too. That happiness, which... At first, as well as in the sequel, deludes the self. 
and which arises from sleep, ind indolence, and heedlessness, that is declared to be tamasic. So I'll share um, just in this experience. It was 1980, so nearly 40 years ago now. But, um, but with me, it was cocaine because I had, I had uh, gone through a lot of the drugs, psychedelics and all of that, but cocaine was a thing. And heedlessness, oh my God, how in the world can this make sense? How can this make sense to put, to put that pleasure above paying the mortgage? <laughs> but somehow in these minds, when they're ungrounded, the craziest notions get, get take shape inside and then we water them, and that's tamas. That's tamas, heedlessness. Heedlessness. So uh, when we have the capacity to avoid tamas, avoid it like the plague, <laughs> because all of what it constructs is dark. Everything it constructs is dark and destructive. Everything that it builds up. Um, and so the... Rajas is a tipping point because, because from Rajas one can either fall into tamas because of trying to avoid the pain and, you know, the substances are everywhere and, and uh, all the places and opportunities to indulge in tamasic activities. And, and even, the, even the urge to just sleep then, just avoid and you know, the depressions and so on that will come are the same are the same tamas so um, and the thing is the only way to escape from tamas is to get up <laughs> even if even if you're getting up in order to take a job or whatever it is at that at that point oh okay um so I'll continue with number 40 any discussion about these before we move on? The pleasures, pleasure, happiness. Then. So the addictions are considered tamas. It's interesting because I would think it was rajas. They may start. They may come from rajas, but then if you look, they'll go down. Right, right, right. right? Yes. And so, it, it, from rajas, we can say, "I'm going to try this," because this seems like. You know, I know people that seem to have some success and some uh, with this, and so and and some very rajasic addiction, sex addiction, etc., like like that, uh, will be born of rajas. But if you look at some point, they'll they'll grab us so hard that heedlessness will come, and so now it's a tip over into tamas. And, and at some point it becomes dark because now life is just about fulfilling that addiction. And, and anything about, about moving, doing something, some goal that I had, something, something that I was going to contribute or some, the rajasic stuff at that point tends to, yeah. tends to fall back and pursuit of that pleasure, whatever that is which has become an all-consuming pleasure. Mm. Well, so, I mean, if uh, you had like a higher goal or a higher purpose or what feels like a higher goal and higher purpose and then uh, you encounter obstacles along the way, which of course you will, right? Yeah, tests or obstacles, yeah. um, it's the question. Hit, when you hit the obstacle and then like, so for me, what's had, what, what often happens is I hit the obstacle and get frustrated and then like sort of like fall, like regress yeah. back. Yeah. Um, what's sort of like, at, like one, what is sort of happening there from the sort of Thomas Rogers perspective? And then two, what's like a way through that that's helpful? Or I mean, I guess there's lots of ways through that, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, so um, one, the first is an attitude related to obstacles. Um, uh, what we call an obstacle is really an opportunity. And so there's reflection that wants to happen around that. 
put your conscious mind into it, look at experience, look at your experience, um, learn how to start asking that question when an obstacle comes, what is the opportunity here? Mm -hmm. So that's a perspective that wants to be encouraged and developed because you'll see that it's true. Yeah. If, if you can take that on and um, so really put some resolve into developing a new attitude about the things that happen because uh, and, and of course yogic practices help with that but the resolve has to come first that's that willpower the, the intellectual process and then the willpower when you change to see it as opportunity everything about it changes yeah, that's really the, um, the biggest thing and maybe the only thing because if you can see it as opportunity, then you can ask the question inside, what is the opportunity here? What am I to learn? Am I to, and we've had so much stuff about ashram. Where ashram is four years old now and it's a constant learning experience and, and things happen to us that people would always call obstacles, but... We can't do that. And so, but it doesn't make any sense when it happens because I thought I knew something, but I really know that I never know. So, and, and mother continues to teach that curriculum. Um, it, it, it's a funny thing. Even, even when I feel like I'm listening very well, something might happen. And these days it's not so much surprising as interesting. <laughs> So I guess my sort of follow-up question that is sort of like, how can I determine? So I guess I've had this idea of like, oh, well, this obstacle is like so big that it like maybe what it's telling me is like, don't go this way. And like, how do I determine that I'm like not stubbornly, like bullheadedly pushing forward in a direction that like maybe isn't actually the best direction versus like, no, I need to like continue going this way. Like how, my ego has gotten involved a lot, so I feel like I just like push stubbornly. Yes. So how do I differentiate between like stubbornly pushing towards something that feels like a higher good to me or seems like the higher goal versus yep. being persistent, right? Like yep. those two can, I can easily fall from persistence to like stubbornness. Understand, absolutely. We have experience there as well. So basic yoga sadhana is the first, which is which is to have a daily reading of one of the Shastras for inspiration and support. Um, and it wants to be daily because otherwise the habit of picking it up when the opportunity is encountered won't be there. So daily reading. Um, second, daily pranayama, and daily work with mantra. Those, those help with grounding so that when the opportunity comes, you're not thrown off so much with it and, and that you develop the habit of asking within and allowing for receptive silence to really step back and look at the situation and have more clarity about it. So you're wanting not to just keep banging your head at that moment you're wanting to pause, push pause, breathe, reflect, ask a question, take a walk in the woods, take Tao for a long walk, something like that, carry him, enjoy his smile and his laughter, and like that. And then it'll come. And it's just step by step from that. We're all on pilgrimage, actually. <laughs> so it's a pilgrim attitude towards things. Pilgrim doesn't have any control of the things that happen to them. We only have control of whether we take a step or not and which direction do we go. So, oh. Okay, um, so we'll close here for the, for the morning. Anything else, any other observations or sharing, dear? Uh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful that I was excited about uh, that persistence and bullheadedness and where we refer to, you know, where we come from. Yeah. Um, and to have that establishment of mantra and shastra is really important in sadhana because we no longer have to refer to the world and we actively can challenge and change, you know, where we come from in a reactive state 
which is just habitual towards that place of us trying what we call like nirvana, our early ideas of that, <laughs> also could be considered what we consider or believe to be a good life. What we've been brought up to believe is a good life. So oh, this thank is you, Hari. A great, great uh, boom to have this prescription for this home. Oh, Hi, Drew, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, Hari, any questions this morning? Okay. Okay, so we'll close. Uh, page 174. Om Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Shantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu, Makashi Dukkapar Pave, Asatoma Satgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotiramaya, Mrityor Maham Mrityam Gamaya, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnam, Purnam Udashate, Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 O adorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and frustrations unto thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Thou art Satyananda. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion, and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. From below Sakura Shivananamarajaki, and for all the saints and sages of all the traditions. Let's stand for